I know this is going to sound harsh, but you become who you hang around. So if everyone you know is an instant person, you're a fucking instant person. Just that simple. All right. Well, welcome, Perfect. welcome, everybody, to episode 20 of the podcast Unlimited Wisdom with Robert Hollis. I'm Craig A. Jackman, along with Matt Hollis, and we are so glad to have you with us today. Our topic today instant results versus long-term thinking. Ooh, uh, this is going to be a very good discussion for everybody, and we're glad to have you with us. Thank you for joining us today and for hitting that subscribe button with the bell to be notified when these podcasts are available. And for those of you who wish to donate to Robert's uh, charitable organizations like Jody Falcon has already. Thank you, Jody Falcon, very much. You, you can Jody. go ahead and hit the dollar sign below either the video or the chat and donate. And all the monies go to organizations that Robert supports. So bless you. And thank you for starting us off, Jody. We appreciate you and we love you. Gentlemen, let's get started. Matt, <laughs> hey Robert, guys. welcome. What a great start to this podcast. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Craig. Always the hostess with the mostest, man. I, I, I just appreciate you. You're you're awesome to have on here. And Matt, thank you so much for getting on here as well. Of course. Uh, I wouldn't miss it. So, <clears throat> well, I'll start out with a quick story uh, uh, about this is, um, you know, it, it, I can remember the first time that someone introduced me. I, I know I could go take the time to, to read this, find out when this is. But one of the books that put me in a tail spin, I don't talk about it much, um, but uh, I just remember and it's something that I recently brought up with Charlie Munger. And it really comes down to the last question that's asked of you is, um, and I never thought about this until I just got a download just now. It, it, don't you think it's interesting that if you're currently in a job or you're currently doing something like that, here's the question. Do you think the company would grow without you? The answer is yes. Because the person that actually is running the company or even had the vision of starting the company was able to come with this thought is that will your business, will your business grow without you? See, we know the company that you're working for will grow without you. <laughs> they just replace you. But when you get in this other realm, I remember reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And in that book, I, I, that's cool that I have it sitting here. Um, he's got this thing called the cash flow quadrant, right? So I guess it's pretty blurry. I'm sorry. Um, I, I can get the picture for everybody. Okay, cool. And um, one of the things that when I read this, I realized, and listen closely, a lot of people are not going to get this. I realized that I was running my business as a self-employed mentality. So what does that mean, self-employed mentality? I was the person. I was the person. I was doing everything. I was doing the training, the presentations. I was doing the recruiting. I was doing everything. And if you want a great analogy to this, it's um, <clears throat> if you don't have anybody in your business that's making a full-time income that they think is respectful, then you're in attrition. So you're constantly losing good people. So if your mentality long-term was, wow, what if I could build something that if I left it, that it, was, it would run on its own, but it would grow on its own. And so when I read this book, uh, I love how Robert Kiyosaki did it because he talked about his poor dad which was a professor in a university in Hawaii. And he had tenure there so long that he became the dean. He became the dean of the Hawaii University. Then he had a friend that he called his, his father was a rich dad. Now, here's a guy like 14% of the people in, the, in America that didn't even graduate from high school. <laughs> And he had this mentality that the reason that I'm supposed to get educated is to make money, correct? Yeah. Well, what if I could make money 
If I focus on just making money, then I don't need an education. <laughs> and so he started his own business and was a multi, multi millionaire. And so Robert Kiyosaki talks about he would have these conversations with his father and it's, of course, get a degree, then get another degree and then get another degree. And, and this is the way to success. But as he said, he didn't see that success with him and his family. It's like, you know, that 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 wasn't an existence of what he thought uh, an incredible lifestyle was. But when he went to visit his friend, his father's home and his father's lifestyle was like, holy cow, this guy's got it on going on. And so right away, he started talking to him and I was sharing. I love sharing the story because the first thing that he said is, listen, you got to have a product that everybody wants and needs and you got to come up with an innovative idea. So what Robert Kiyosaki was a surfer and what he did is he came up and he invented the Velcro wallet. And the wallet was made out of nylon, so it would never ever come, up, you know, come apart. But it also allowed sort of like it had like a Ziploc thing inside the wallet. So if you put your money and your paper money in there, you went like this, and it it, it zipped it, ziplocked it, and then when you closed it, it was a Velcro wallet. And so it cost him two dollars to have some of his friends, his mom's friends, to build these for him. And then he would go out and sell them. And so he was so proud and he went back to his rich dad and he said, listen, I sold 10 wallets today for $10 each. And his, and the guy said, what is your cost? Sort of like Shark Tank, right? And and right away he said, oh, he said, I, I, it cost me $2 to make them with material and everything. So he said, you got $8 in profit. And he goes, I do. And he says, $80 in a day. You know, this was probably back in the 60s. You know, that that's that's impressive. That's really impressive. And he said, but uh, you're doing it wrong. And he goes, what do you mean? He goes, do you know other surfers that don't want to have a job because they want to be available when the waves are good? And he goes, I know a lot of them. He said, well, tell them that you'll give them $5 for every wallet they sell. So he says, charge them $5 or loan them to them. And you got to get as many surfers as you can. So now if you have 10 surfers that are selling 10 wallets, right? Now you got a hundred wallets, but he only made $3 per wallet. He made 300 bucks instead of 80 bucks. And see, this is the concept that a lot of people don't think about because we grow up in a world where it's all about us. How much am I going to make? What am I going to earn? Why are they taxing me? And as long as you have that mentality and you don't think about building an empire over time, me and Matt were talking before we jumped on here and uh, Mr. Beast just hit 300 million subscribers. All crazy. right. I know that sounds crazy, but how many of you know the answers without knowing the answers. I love saying that. So how many of you right now believe that, you know, with everyone contributing and and give, buying his candy bars and buying his merch and sharing his videos, not including what YouTube pays him, how many, how much of the community that, that Mr. Beast has want to continue to contribute so he can continue to give money? I watched one of his recent videos and he built a hundred homes for a uh, hundred people that lost their home. And I'm just going like, yeah, I mean, <laughs> you, can you imagine making so much money? So me and Matt were talking, if you're not, if you don't get the concept that, and why we brought this up is most people would say, well, of course I want to help other people. And of course I would like to make money to do whatever I want and never have a job to be enslaved. Of course I would until you have to do it consistently over and over again for a period of time to get the results. So right now there's people that I can show exactly how to build that empire and how to have subscribers and how to have, 
you know, subscribers that are active, that are paying you on a monthly basis. And I've worked for 37 years in companies like that. But people's expectations are, I need to work from Monday and Friday and I need to be fucking paid. I am not interested in anything to do with this long-term bullshit. So they look at the influencers that they're influenced by. They look at the YouTubers and the people that have podcasts that they're inspired by. They're just not willing to do something consistently over a period of time to build this. And so I wanted to bring this up because I see people that are in the drive-in at fast food restaurants and they're pissed off. You know, it's like you wasn't there that long. If you walk in, there's always someone that likes, well, what? Hmm, I wonder. It's like this is the same fucking menu. You know, can <laughs> you, you know, so you see a majority of people that want instant food, they want instant success, they want instant everything. So there's a lot of people that, you know, in the younger group and in the older group would go, wow, I'd like to build a podcast. I'd like to build a, a, a YouTube channel. I'd like to build a, a, a monthly subscriber base. Um, I just need it to happen by this Friday. <laughs> yeah, that, no, ahead. that's I, I love what you're saying, because it's like I think that we all go through this process, right, of um like maybe you'll get really excited about something and then you'll go, OK, I'm going to learn. I'm going to learn how to do this particular thing or whatever it may be. And you go into research phase and you go, I got to find and accumulate the best information. Smart idea. Smart yeah. idea. Buy, accumulate, buy the books, buy the courses, watch the YouTube videos, find the best of the best at what they're doing and start learning and researching from them. And then we get to this place where our long-term thinking is I will be a success at this because I have all the information, but the short-term results because they require practice to get to where that person was, that your, your tastes and your abilities mentally may be there, but your experience and practice is all the way back here. So because that's the case, when you get started, you think that there will be more instantaneous results by more research. But if you've ever right. watched anyone that's made a success out of themselves, it comes from practice and consistency and those things more than it comes from knowing the right things. You can know right. all of the wrong things in the world and still be a success if you're determined. And this is one of those age Absolutely. old sayings. Oh, Consistency Absolutely. will beat talent every single time. Yep. And that's true. You could be the most talented person, but if you're not consistent at making things or doing stuff that you like to be doing, then you're never going to really get there. Right. And I think that that's something that we all struggle with. Like I struggle with that pretty consistently where like I'll be consistent for others, but not for myself. Right. Say that like again. In the, well, I'll be consistent <laughs> for others, again. but not for myself. Yep. And that that always comes back to that that thing of trust, right? Where it's like I I, I trust my yourself. capabilities with others, yeah. but I don't trust my capabilities with myself, right? And that always comes back to like really what you want or what you want to be doing. And here I am finding out, you know, my whole entire life I've been I've wanted to be a storyteller, right? And here I'm finding out, oh, okay, I'm actually not a one note person. I never was a one note person. And I kind of like the streaming and content creation stuff. I kind of like doing it. It's it's enjoyable. You're, I love building you're, a community. You're, you're good at it. Thank you. And so since now that's the case, I would have never known that if I wouldn't have put myself out there and tried. But I was watching some professional streamer talk about people getting started streaming. And he did this whole guide on it, right? You can look him up. His name's Ludwig. But he goes through the first slide of his presentation, right? And um, this dude's made, you know, I think one year he made 2.5 million off streaming, um, not counting endorsed. That's just Twitch. But um, yeah, not sponsors or anything else. And so the first slide that comes up is him saying, go live, you asshole. <laughs> if you have not made anything or have not gone live yet or made Isn't an that attempt. Just do it. Yeah. He's like, if you haven't even made the attempt. Then, then shut this video off because you're doing yeah. exactly what I just shared. 
you're going, oh, Ludwig's a big streamer. He's made millions doing this. Or uh, Mr. Beast is a big content creator. So I'll just watch. And I've done this, you guys. I'll just watch five compilations of him giving advice. And then what do I do? I don't implement the advice right. immediately. So then it just becomes stockpiled full of ideas. And what do that stockpile of ideas make you do? It's like it makes you overthink what you're capable of or your decisions. Because yeah. now you're worried about making the wrong decision. There's so much information out there. Maybe I, I, I don't know it yet and I need more. Or I have all this information, but man, how long would it take me to implement these things? It's going to take me a bit. And maybe I need, I need a new computer before I could do this. So I'm going to have to go work for a bit, get some money together and buy a new computer. Because there's just no way right. I could write a screenplay without a new computer. <laughs> I got to clean my office yeah. too. Oh, exactly. <laughs> got to clean right. my office and I got to set the desk up a certain way. And we all, we all had these experiences, yes. right? Because and I, still, and I still do. Yeah. All the time, all the time. So I still do. I, I, I took a, what apparently was, uh, um, a giant banner that had unlimited wisdom on it. And, and I not only bought the banner, but then I figured out how to put it in this office and then I hung it out, hung it, uh, and I couldn't stand to come in my office because the vinyl smell was so bad that it was actually, <laughs> it was actually messing up my throat. Yeah. It, it, it was like, mm -hmm. it was constricting my throat. And so I reached out to the company that made it and they're going, that's made for a conference room or outside where you can it's put like it a picture. up where people can take yeah. pictures and stuff right you go they go you don't have that like in the house and i go i not only have it in a house i have it in a like a 10 by 10 office space a room <laughs> and it's right behind okay. me so i yeah. i can huff it from behind you know? yeah i gotta be really close to it and so if any one of you ever seen, well, hey, Robert used to have that banner and then he got rid of it. It's like, but that's you, know, you trying things. Right. And that's one of yeah. those things is, is yeah. if I didn't, if I didn't put myself out there and I'll, I'll tell you guys this perfect example, because I shared it with Hannah last night. So I'm sitting here right before I go to bed and I'm rewatching that Ludwig video on how to become a streamer in 2024, which is the video I, it, okay. in specific. And I'm rewatching it. And I remember the first time I watched it because it's a couple of months old at this point. And I watched it and that that screen came up. Have you gone live? Don't stop right now. And I kept watching even though I hadn't gone live yet. And last night I'm rewatching it. I'm watching him go through all the tips and I'm like, I'm implementing this stuff now. I feel good watching this because instead Proud of you. Proud I've already, of you. I've already gone live. I've been live for hours. I've done these things. I mean, I've been live on this channel. Even yesterday I was live for an hour. So yeah, of course. Yeah, I watched it. You did a great job. You guys Thank got to check that you. out, man. Well, I'm always trying to add more value to the imaginators and stuff here too, because there's stuff that I want to share with you guys. Right. Yeah. I'm just so excited about this stuff. But if I would, the thing is, is that I think here's the thing. When, when this came up as a topic, instant results versus long-term thinking, I thought to myself, okay, the streaming thing, I wouldn't have known without the instant results of actually trying to do it and seeing how that felt. True. And That's the long, the and by long find out about whether you like right, something right. or not is by doing it. I mean, uh, you know, okay, master Yoda do or do not. There is no try. So you may fumble just like what you said about Mr. Beast. You may fumble in the beginning, but each time you physically do it, you're going to get gooder and gooder. Mm -hmm. And the more experience that you have, and then plus you learn along the way. I, I'm, I've always been an advocate of get started, do it with whatever it is you've got. You may not have the best equipment. You may not have the best camera, but just do it. I mean, people, gosh, we, we have cell phones. You know, you can, you can, you can do right. a podcast like this just on your own, just with your cell phone. And soon with AI, oh, yeah. you won't even need good mics. But yeah. the, the, the cool thing about it too, is just putting yourself in a position to find out like when, when you go through all those things and you think, okay, this could be for me or whatever. How many people don't have a problem? Maybe this is just a particular personality type, but like how many people here don't have a problem with going out of their way to learn something to help somebody that they love and care about. Yeah. I think that's a given. 
It's so, a hack. So it's, it's not like, only a hack, Matt. It's yeah. like it's like it's like it's crazy that you have zero. Listen to me, zero interest in what the other people, the other person asked you about. Zero. It's never even crossed your mind. And you're sitting with someone, and someone is going, "Ah, oh, man." You know what? What? What would you think would be a good book? Uh, you know, because I'm struggling right now with thinking long term. And my response is, "Hey, let me go on AI and ask it. Let, let me let me get this link for you. Then after I find Rich Dad Poor Dad, then what I'm going to do is send you the link, and I'm also going to send you his YouTube channel. It's like, oh, by the way, let me send this over to you. I'm going to send this over to you in a, in a PDF format, and it's like." But okay, now it's my turn to do something. Now I need to do this for myself. I can't trust myself. I got to research. I got to listen to multiple people. Uh, by listening to multiple people, I end up sometimes getting overexcited, you know, like the Dunning Kruger effect that we're talking about. And then all of a sudden, I get this crazy enthusiasm. I get this crazy enthusiasm about what they're talking about and 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 because they're excited so, right so it's I, I like can't, i'm so damn excited that i got to reach out to matt and craig and go oh my god have you seen this guy look look what the <laughs> hell he's doing and it's like robert what he's not doing anything that we want to do that's not part of your imagination do you see yourself doing what he's doing a year from now two years from now God dang it, I forgot. I, I don't want to do anything that guy's doing. Then why oh, are you yeah. sharing everything with me? <laughs> I just, well, I mean, that's the thing too, is like I watched the whole video with Ludwig, right? And any of you guys that are interested in streaming, I recommend checking it out. But you watch that video. I have, and he goes, write down the three people, and I've had people do this, but write down like the three people that you would like to be like content creator wise, streamer wise or channels and and if you can't f think of three then you're you you don't know what you're doing yet right. like you have to have three in my three lists ludwig is not in my list of three <laughs> oh, wow because even though i admire him a lot the dude is a workaholic animal that i am not i know i'm my passion for it is not at that level my passion right. in it is for building a community of people that are interested in shit and like entertaining them and educating them at the same time if I can. And that's my skill set. Am I going to do reality game shows on my Twitch? It, no, I'm not. You know what I mean? Like his <laughs> right. Who's who knows? Who's, who's you find your yeah. niche yeah. and you master the mundane. That's one thing yeah. that we always uh, promote here on unlimited wisdom or with Robert Hollis, you know, it's, mastering the mundane doing the best that you can with what you have and start from scratch start from nothing and continue to master that whatever it is right that task that uh that thing that thing that you do or i like to say that voodoo that you do so well whether you're an actor whether you're a singer whether you're matt whether you're you know you do the uh, ai stuff and you the animation uh, Robert, when you do the motivation, it's something that you find that you love, that you value, that you want to share with somebody yeah. and you want to make sure that you start doing it and do it with the best of intentions. And that is a key thing is you're doing it with the best of intentions. You're not getting rich quick off it because I, I don't know how many people I'm, I'm one who was that way a long time ago where it's like you go into, you, you become a salesman at a stereo store. So you yeah. want to sit there and you want to grab the first person that walks in the door. You want to sell them the big, big ticket item and you want to throw them out the store. You don't want to see them again. You want to take the profits and that's part of your commission. Yeah, that works for only a short period of time. And you promote this so much, Robert, when it comes to some of the other organizations that you have been involved with, where it's not so much slamming the person, which is at least the way I call it. You slam them, you get it done and you move on and you don't think about them anymore. And then they come back at you, say, help, help, help. And you go, what? You don't need my help. You already got. No, 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 no. You nurture, you develop. You master the mundane, you help them along the way so that they understand so that as you have shared, 
they can do it on their own. How many yeah. stories have you shared with everybody on here where it's like, okay, you got it. You do your steps, step by step so that they understand it. Keep it super simple, the KISS method. And then once they get it, let them leave you because now they know exactly what to do. Right. You should, and, you and, should want that. I, I well, sorry to interrupt you, Dad, but you should want them to do that. Like people yeah. should have the capabilities to go off on their own way. The, I've said this before. The more that people are required to lean on you um, to get things done, that's a dangerous position to be in. Very dangerous. So it, it, in, in my mind, I'm actively trying to avoid that to the point now where I'm like, I got Craig doing Vizard. I got my dad editing his own videos sometimes like. So, so I, I, I think what's so interesting about it is you, you start to see the people that want to help you and you collaborate with them instead of, so instead you build a team of people that a community of people that care instead of people that, um, and Bob Johnson said this in the comments, right? I hate when you do all the research for somebody and then they don't use any of it. Why did they even ask right. for all that information? Mm-hmm. Man, I can't even tell you guys it's, yeah, well, it's I, a lesson I, learned. how many times that's happened to me. <laughs> oh my God. So we all yeah. do that, especially, right. especially because we care about the other pe the other people and the other person. And we have our own integrity that we want to make sure that they get the right information and that we're not giving them the wrong information. And yeah, exactly. I, I did a post. I, I, uh, I got to give a shout out. Who was, who posted that? Um, I think, I don't remember now. I'm sorry. But right before I got on here, I seen a post from one of our inner circle people. And I love that it said, the world, the world will ask you who you are. And if you don't know, the world will tell you. Yep. I saw and what that I too, think yeah. that that whole concept of, uh, you know, people, whether they want to believe in the six human needs or not. You know, we all need love. We all need connection. We all need, uh, you know, excitement in our life. So we need uncertainty just as much as we need certainty. So, you know, that's when people get really, really bored, right? They don't have enough uncertainty in their lives. Mm -hmm. And so we need significance. We, we, we need this stuff. And so contribution. So then when we go out there and we say, ah, I don't need any of that stuff, then the very next thing that happens is someone tells us, and that that we need something and then we're following them until we quit <laughs> and i tell this story all the time because i love being um you know real with every one of you uh, i i i look at my entire life i'm 62 years old and the list of things that i've finished versus the list of things that i've quit it's grossly grossly higher the things that I tempted and quit, tempted and quit. Now, some of those were things that I just figured out that I just went, this doesn't match me. This I'm not enjoying in this. I don't see this as a long-term deal. And the biggest thing I think that people need to do is really ask themselves and again, trust themselves that what's most important for me is my freedom. And the second one is I do get jacked up by helping other people get results that they didn't think they could get. I, I'm addicted to other people's success, not my own. And so those are the two that, that really get me. So if you don't know yourself and you don't take the time to find out again, we can help you get whatever you want, but most people don't know what they want. So, <laughs> Mark Twain. So, so now all of a sudden you got to dive into that thing. Well, I don't like playing guitar. I, I, I wanted to play guitar. I quit. I, I played trumpet. I quit. You know, there's a lot of things that I attempted to do and I quit. And, and, uh, and then sometimes you're sort of forced out of it. You know, I, I loved being a mechanic, but then all of a sudden it became where I just couldn't see, I couldn't see an end to what I was doing. You know what I mean? And uh, believe it or not, a very wealthy guy helped me with that. He said, if you want to be a crew chief, why don't you find? Why instead of investing all the time and energy into being a crew chief and you're on this corporate ladder and no one wants to ask for help, that's weak, right? 
And so this guy said to me, listen, if, you know, I got a cast on my leg. What do you want to be? I want to get this cast off and I'm going to go be a, uh, uh, I can sit on my ass and be a cruise chief. I, I don't need my leg. That's my goal. And he said, Have you, he said, do you know any crew chiefs? And I said, I do. And he says, why don't you take them out for a cup of coffee or a beer and just ask them, just simply ask them if you had it to do all over, would you do it again? 10 out of 10 said no fucking way. Why do we look at people and inspire to be like them when they feel like they created their own trap? I mean, I think fame is a trap. I think a lot of people idolize fame and fortune in such a way. But what they don't realize is that everything that you make a decision for in life has a repercussion, regardless if it's a good thing or a bad thing, because you are making a decision. And by the way, indecision is also a decision. So yeah, going, 100. I'm not going to decide. I'm, that's also a bad, not a good idea. But regardless of what it is, you're making a decision. If I get married now, I'm now in a committed relationship. I'm no longer in the dating pool. I'm no longer looking for a spouse. These types of things are decisions you make in your life. I want to have children. I want to start a business. Um, do people get divorced? Yes. Do people lose their business or start a different one? Yes. Um, so I it, that's the thing. Like you're sharing, Dad. You go through that whole entire process. But the thing is, is that we don't really see. And I love the whole, I think it was, um, you'll, I, his name's escaping me, but you'll know immediately. But the seasons thing. Right. You go Jim through Rowan. seasons. Oh, Jim, Jim Rowan. Rowan. Right. I, his name. I knew who it was. It's just. Didn't remember his name. <laughs> but the the season shift, I'm I'm coming more to terms with the fact that that is. Back and forth, back and forth. It's like a yin yang, you know yeah. what I mean? Like an infinity sign almost. Right. It's yeah. like back and forth. You have these down slopes where you're like, I don't really like what's going on right now. And then right. you have these up slopes where you're like, man, I really hope this doesn't stop. You know what I mean? <laughs> if anyone's been in love, you know that, man, I hope this goes on forever. Like anybody that falls in love hopes that that's the person, right? Because mm -hmm. then you're like, I hope this love stays forever, right? Or you start a business. You're like, maybe this was it. Maybe this is what I was born to do. Like maybe this is the thing. But the thing truthfully is, is that you go through those seasons. And what those seasons do is like test you and what you want. Yeah. And, and, and some, when, yeah. Go ahead, Craig. No, no, I was going to say, and that's part of the experience of getting to whatever endpoint you are going to do. Uh, I know we've yeah. shared this many times where we think, many of us think, I should say, is that success is a straight line from start to finish. It's not. It's a jag of lines that go in every different direction. Uh, I, in fact, there was even this one video I love is where you see a guy with a trampoline and stairs and he starts off on the lower stair, goes uh, uh, bounces a on the trampoline, rat. and then goes up another two stairs, then does the same thing up all the way to the top. He gets almost to the top and then falls back down, and he goes back down again. And then it's like Sisyphus, it gets enough, right? Yeah, and then he gets yeah. enough momentum and picks himself back up, and he finally gets to the top of the stairs. It's not that simple. There are obstacles to everything in life. And I know this is a quick way of saying it, but still there's obstacles. But do you have in mind where you want to be? Is this a goal? Maybe it's not. Maybe you have to open the doors up to a certain point that are available to you, but then you want that final door. It's not going to open no matter what you do. So what do you got to do? Find a new door. That's going right. to open based on the skill set that you have right now. And that's the key. That's where the mastering of the mundane comes in because you had to master a skill set to get to you, to get yourself to this point in time. So what's the next door that you want to try to open? Well, let's go this direction. Maybe this will work. Maybe it won't, but at least you're going in a direction and you're keeping in mind that vision of what you want and this is the best way at this moment in time to get there. Yep. Uh, and talking about this Dunning-Kruger effect, I just think it's, you know, that we need to stay on this. This is new information to me. Uh, I knew that people did it. I just didn't know that there was a study on it. <laughs> and where the study came from, believe it or not, was why 
do people feel smarter than they actually are? See, it was funny how I stumbled across this because in my mentality of wanting to help as many people as I can impact them, uh, you know, we have a, a nonprofit called Unlimited Wisdom. And really, truly, all I am is a seeker of knowledge and a seeker of wisdom. I found people that had that wisdom because I was a seeker. <clears throat> and then I believe one of my gifts that I love most about myself is, is my persistence, how consistent I am. And so, you know, we always hear this thing that you eat an elephant one bite at a time. I'm the kind of person that when I grew up, the way I got my satisfaction, the way I got my my attaboys is, is I was the kind of person that could work on something and, and know that I could work on it, not based on hours or how much money or how much time it was to finish something. And I remember one time hearing this, that one guy I, I know very, very well, uh, he's a very successful person. And he says this all the time. He's like one of these guys that just happened to be around Earl Nightingale. And he asked er Earl Nightingale, and he says, listen, I want so much to be successful. And, and he goes, what do you think your problem is? And immediately, if you just listen to people, he was saying, I tried this and it I didn't work. And I tried this and it didn't work. And then, then I tried this for a little while and I didn't work. And then I was sort of burnt out. So then I stepped away for a while and did some other things. And then I came back and I tried this and it didn't work. And he goes, oh, I have the perfect solution for you. And he goes, really? And he says, yeah, finish fucking something. Just finish something. And I always tell people, the people that I've learned from, the way you can get this habit of finishing something is just look around your house. Just look around your house, look around your apartment, look at all the stuff that you have and finish little things, little, little, tiny things. I know that a lot of you will laugh when I say this, but there used to be this phrase, and I know that it's good today. But if you look at an auto mechanic's car, it's never finished. <laughs> Why? Or it's like a chef. They'll like come home and like throw a frozen dinner in the in the microwave after they worked <laughs> yeah. and made food. It's all like day. if you go to someone that's a contractor, you can walk around their whole house and why why haven't you put that door in? You know, are you <laughs> planning on putting a garage? Door? I've actually seen this. <laughs> yeah, yes, uh, we, I know we, people we, that are that way. We drive right. by this house all the time on our way to uh, uh, going in town from where we live, twenty minutes outside of Billings, and this guy has had the Lowe's white paper that you put on it to protect the wood. And I'm not exaggerating for probably 15 years. So he did this <laughs> addition to his house and he built this big giant tower on his house and then he just didn't finish it. Well, why do I bring that up? Is if you can look around and find little things that you can accomplish. Maybe you didn't totally read that book. Maybe you didn't totally do something to its fulfillment. Like I always ask people to read the, the Greatest Miracle in the World by Og Mandino. And then what I do is I very simply, next time I talk to him, is first I told him, read the book and then call me. I brought this up the other day because this is just humans. This is how big this is. Instant versus long term. I have probably in 37 years of being told to get that book. Again, I'm not bragging. Uh, my mentor said, Robert, you're, you're, he didn't, he, he didn't really say this. He just said, there's one thing that you need to change before I can share with you what to do. That's what he said. And he said, you have some programming that needs to be eliminated. And he said, so go to the, go to the bookstore, grab this book. And then when you get done with it, call me. 37 years, I know I promoted this book on virtually thousands, thousands. I, you know what? My mind just clicked. Hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands live presentations I've done all over the world and on video and told people to do that. 
and I probably have had like eight. Right. <laughs> eight people out mm -hmm. of maybe a half a million people. And so when you're looking for those unique individuals out there that can dream and imagine something in existence so they can be consistent, that's the key. So then when I did that, I called Bill right away. Uh, uh, um, it took me a long time to go through the book because it's difficult for me to, to um, comprehend and, and, and read certain words, but I knew this was something that I needed to do. And so when I called him, he said, what is the assignment that the book gave you? And I said, I'm supposed to read chapter nine every night before I go to bed. And he goes, are you going to do that? And I went, yeah. So how many people that will watch this live or recorded you reach out to people and we call them, listen closely, we call them assholes. A-S-K-H-O-L-E. They're assholes. These are the people that constantly reach out to you, go, can I get a minute? Can you tell me what to do? Please, please, please. You know, I'm about ready. I can't pay rent. I'm going to lose my home. And you say to them, you know, hey, listen, let me tell you what to do. And then they don't do it. See, that's someone that's that reaches out to someone that's already has evidence of their ability to not only do the thing, but master the thing and then master it to a point where they've taught other people how to master the thing. So it's not only a black belt, but then all of a sudden a black belt that has other black belts that they taught. And then there are a second or third degree black belt. And then they teach another group of black belts. But now they have students that are each actually teaching black belts. Right. And no one looks for this. No one looks for this. You know, I, I think legacy is really thrown around a, a lot. You know, I like to build a legacy, but a true legacy is actually leaving pe people in a better place than when you found them. That, that's all it is. So when people reach out to me that are ass calls and I ask them, what day are you on? And they're like, what? And there's only a few people in my entire life that can give me a number. And it's surprising. The people that give me a number are not only people that seen such a significance in the reprogramming of who they are, but then the next thing they do is they do it again and they do it again. They always know that when, like Matt said, you know, you can call it winter or whatever, but uh, I have a lot of trophies that are blurred behind me. And when I first got in this industry, my goal was, wow, what if I had 30,000 people responsible for my income? Wow. One day. No, I, can I get there by next week? I'd like to do that <laughs> before the end of the year. I, I knew this was going to take me a while to build. Mm -hmm. And then as I built that and achieved that, which made me a million plus a year before the age of 30, then I met another group of people and they had 200,000, 300,000. Now think about this, Matt and Craig, this is before social media. So if you had a group of people, if you had 200, 300,000 people underneath you, man, now all of a sudden, you know, you're not $80,000 a month. You're like two, 300,000 a month. And a lot of people are going like, there's not people out there like this. Yeah, they are. A lot of them. <laughs> right. You know, now there's this concept called employees where people have millions of employees. And I always thought it was interesting whenever you talk about an individual, isn't it funny that they can say that one thing? The one quick story I have for you guys is my first, one of my first mentors, Roger Penske. Some of you are going to hear me do a dig. Don't get mad. But <laughs> but this person was going to get a presidential freedom award. It's the largest 
largest award that uh, a, 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 a human a presidential being medal of civilian. Honor. Civilian yeah, a civilian, yeah. a civilian can get in the and, United States. Yeah. Yeah. And it was given to Roger Penske. It's like being knighted in, 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 in Great Britain, you know, UK being exactly. knighted by the queen or the king. And so it was the Roger Penske and the person that gives gave it to him without giving a dig was Donald Trump. So what was funny is I see Donald Trump walk up to the podium to do his presidential duty. And he's reading the bio of my mentor. And he doesn't know him. And so he goes, well, we're here today to give the award away. Uh, I can see here he's been a businessman for 54 years. Um, he has 77 com com companies. And he's looking at it, Roger Penske, and he's going, <laughs> 77 companies and uh you have over 300,000 employees. And then he's going, wow, wow. And then he looks down and he goes, you've won to Indianapolis 500 18 times with 13 different drivers. And he is like, what? I mean, it was funny to, for him to read a bio of somebody where he's going, this guy is flat out kicking my ass. <laughs> he's documenting. For real, for real. <laughs> but also has an impeccable, impeccable leadership. You know, not doing stupid things, giving to charity. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like, he's like looking at it going, I wish this was my bio. I really could kick ass if I had this bio. It's <laughs> <laughs> funny. I, yeah, I was just looking him up because I was wondering how much he was worth and how old he is now. He's 87 and he's 3.7 billion as of today. Yeah. So that's and and he's still active. I mean, how, oh how my God. did he, he get just the, won he the Indianapolis ever? 500 again? Yeah. Yep. How and long ago did he buy the track, though? Because I, I know this was a lifelong dream listen, of his. His first, it first, what got him into racing was his dad took him to the Indianapolis 500 when he was nine years old. And he's done so much for the racing industry worldwide that the Thomas family owned the track for five generations. Mm hmm. And they endowed it to him. Because the cars that race on it are Indy cars, Indy 500. And just like Warren Buffett, if Roger Penske didn't step in, there wouldn't be no Indy cars. He was dominating it. Then he like took it over. And then he basically, everyone said, there's no one's going to make this work and make it profitable for anybody other than Roger Penske. So they just basically asked him through votes of people saying, would you please take this over for us? And when the family could no longer uh, afford the keep up for the Indianapolis 500, they endowed it to him. Just went, you need to take this over. But that was his goal. That was his imagination when he started at the age of nine. Well, I want to race here one day. He did. He became a world champion racer. Then he went, I'm going to step in and be a car owner. Then he became an all owner. Then his goal was to hit pole with Indy 500. I think he's done that probably 30 times. And then he wanted to win it. He won it. And then he started going, what if I won one and two? What if I took first and second place? And then he had three cars and he went, wouldn't it be cool if I won an Indianapolis 500? And when they come around three abreast, which is the only track they do it with, what if they came around corner four and as they're coming down the straightaway, three, three wide, 11 rolls deep, if number one, two, and three were all Penske cars? Now he's pulled that off like six freaking times. Mm -hmm. Then his goal was, what if they finish first, second, third? He's done that multiple times. <laughs> yeah, wouldn't it? I mean, it, it wasn't instant, instant success. It wasn't well, was instant say, success. You it bring up was a great over point. long term. Go ahead, Matt. I'm sorry. I just I, no, I wanted to point no, that I out agree because with you. It's... you know you have the vision, and the vision takes time. 
Well, I was just thinking, too, as you were saying that, you know, like as as you see certain people and they like knock down different goals, right? Like how great would it feel to have a goal on your list of something you've wanted to accomplish in your life and to scratch it off and have to come up with a new goal? Oh, how great is that? I love you know? doing that. Exactly. I love doing that. So that's the thing is like, I feel like you got to set some goals for yourself. Just like you were saying, you, you accomplish certain things for some people. It's going to require more. Like for some people, it's going to require less. Everybody's different. You know, if you, if your goal, I used to always make this joke with my mom, right? Because she'd, she'd, she would, or other people would ask me what I wanted to do. Right. Like with my life. Right. Like my grandparents would ask me, uh, family, friends or whatever, right? And my response to them always, instead of what I actually wanted to do, my response always was, you know, those guys or those women that lay the, the cones down on the side of the road, the cone people. And then you see them out there and they're picking all the cones up and everybody would go. Yeah. And I'm like, that's my goal is to be that cone guy. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, now, now that you've laid that out, right? Why? I don't have a well. That's the funny thing about it is, is I think it's such a uh, funny question, and even to this day, I still do to ask somebody what they want to do with their life. So that's why it's it a joke. Yet. Because if you would have asked me years ago, I would have said, "I want to be a film director. I want to do this and that. Right? I want to work. I want to work in Hollywood." Um, I didn't. I didn't see society and the world going the way that it was back when I wanted to be a film director. Um, movies even weren't the same way they are now. Yeah. So because of that, I've shifted what I've wanted. Now, if I still wanted the same goal, like imagine your goal right now is to be a graphic designer, you know, and this was one of my goals. If you would have asked me when I was younger, graphic designer, animator, um, a majority of animators right now, graphic designers are out of a job because of artificial intelligence. So doesn't mean you still can't practice those things or do those things, but you mm -hmm. do have to adapt and you do have to change. And I think that that's one of those things is like when I a answered the question that way, and I still love my answer to that question is because I, I think it's such a crazy question to ask somebody what yeah. they want to do with their life. And the thing that's crazy about it is if I respond with that, what is people's normal response? They're like, oh, you're not, you don't want to go to college. You don't want, you don't have higher ambitions than that. <laughs> or whatever society puts on you. Well, that's them, right? Because well, exactly. even society but is subjective. Society is what group you're in at that time. Everybody has an opinion on what you should do. With if I hung life. out, if it's I hung like out with stoners all the comment. time, they'd, they'd be like, oh. dude, smoking weed's the best thing ever. What are you talking about? You're, you've nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the thing is like, it, you become who you hang around and everything like that. But I really think there's such a huge aspect to just allowing yourself to live your life, be present and flow from one thing to the other. Yeah. And k taking yourself out of that creative place also like takes you out of your creative place in all the other areas, your relationships, your like, if you're not feeding and sustaining yourself, then it's very difficult to plan a date for your spouse when you're not even capable of planning something for yourself. <laughs> very good. You very know what good. I mean? Cause Obviously, you take better care of yourself. You'll be better to the people around you. I've seen this firsthand in my life. So um, I'm I'm just a firm believer in going with the flow now more than I was. Like my goal yeah. every day is to get into that flow state, put my headphones on, make something, get into that flow state for a couple hours and make some shit that I'm proud of, whether it's right. writing, whether it's animating, whether it's editing videos, whether it's writing, making copy or campaigns or whatever I end up doing. Right. So, yeah. And, and the goal in life is uh, when we were talking about Roger Penske, you know, to think that he set another goal last year, I mean, another record last year, uh, he's the only person that won a world championship in two different sports. You know what I mean? So oh, wow. he not only he not only won the IndyCar series, which he's won multiple times, including the Indianapolis 500, but he won the world championship in NASCAR, you know, with a first time winner. And, and it's like, it's like this guy helps people fulfill their dreams mm -hmm. and his own too. Like he gets, yeah. To, yeah. I'm, I'm always going to idolize people 
that reach a certain point and instead of doing like this move like everybody else get below me like i nobody's better than me right you know what i mean instead of doing that move how great is it when you see a guy like roger penske or a person like steven spielberg mentor the next set of people and they're better than everybody because yeah. instead of having to go through that passage way they had they had an actual mentor there that gave a shit enough yeah. to go hey this is not a good idea this would work this way better if you did it this or that way and they cared enough about the person to let them have their own journey to that yeah. same spot yeah so. i i'm mm -hmm. i you know i actually i think people will be blown away you know and in, in the last couple of months i just keep drilling down and drilling down and and you know me it's like i i I have a lot of wisdom and, and I've applied a lot of that wisdom and I'm a great executor and, and things. And, um, one of the things that I found out is that I don't really enjoy mentoring people because for me personally, I take it too personally. And so I can't help people participate in their own rescue. It, it, it's something that's just weird about the world today to think that I came up with this idea of doing this podcast and a lot of people that will watch it live or recorded hopefully years from now just say, you want me to think what I'm doing a year from now? Fuck that. You're like, I don't even know what the next year is going to look like. <laughs> yeah. And then here's the other thing is you ask them to write down their perfect day. And it's like, nah, I ain't going to participate in that. So they're so stuck in their old programming of instant everything, instant everything, going from thing to thing to thing to thing to thing. And here's me. More than anything, I believe my gift is promoting. I'm not interested in rewriting this fucking book. <laughs> Listen closely. My gifts are not there. I'm not interested in rewriting Science of Getting Rich. I'm not rewriting uh, Rich Dad Poor Dad. But I know that I'm one of the top 10 people in the world that have promoted the fuck out of this book. Because for the right people that can actually read it and finish a fucking assignment, <laughs> those people are the ones that are in my 67 people that have earned over a million in commissions or the nine that actually started their own companies that have helped millions and millions of people. And so I'd rather, you know, I'd rather find the stuff. So the reason I brought that up is Man, the thing I love more than anything is learning. I love learning. I love studying the old things. So recently I've been going through the Leave the Field by Earl Nightingale. I'm not interested in redoing Earl Nightingale's deal <laughs> of Leave the Field. I'm not interested in redoing uh, uh, Acres of Diamonds. So I love finding these things. And two, I love finishing them. Then three, I love executing them to show evidence. And then the people that are at the right people at the right time that can honestly say when they watch this video, oh my God, they're talking about me. I haven't finished a fucking thing. That's only two reasons that I think that you're that way. You're listening closely. The first one's going to blow you away. It's going to go against every belief that you have. You don't realize that failure isn't failure. It's just lessons. You found a lot of stuff that you don't really want. I have friends that are a couple years younger than me that are still not married. They're not interested in getting married. Every time I meet them, it's someone new. <laughs> yeah, or they've been married a couple of times, right? And they're, they're 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 practicing to find the right person. Exactly. <laughs> and and uh, you know, 
when you talk to people that get in their 40s and 50s and 60s that are still not married, you know what the number one thing that you hear? I'm set in my ways. It just takes one perspective. And believe it or not, Steve Harvey has this quote. And he wrote a book that, you know, he's not that into you. <laughs> it's a best-selling book written by a male. And the most people that buy it are females. And he said, here's how you know someone's not into you. They don't change anything they do. They meet you. They still got guys night out. They still have their hobbies. <laughs> mm -hmm. And they want you to be an add-on to their life. But when a guy finds the one, there's not a area of life that's not affected. Their whole life changes because they're that into her. Priorities Isn't that change. powerful? Yeah, of course. Oh, yeah. And so, you know, I can't say anything negative about these guys, but they treat relationships like most people in the world treat their lives. Well, hit it's it, like miss it. Hit it. Instant results. Hit it. Versus move on. on. Hit it. Yeah. Move on. Hit, hit it. it yeah. Move on. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's it's hard too because you see you see a lot of people that are living different lives than you may want to live, and you you go how how the fuck is that working for them? And it's mm -hmm. it's just our our natural subjective experience of like looking at somebody else and not trying or not understanding that people are different, and that. There's people on this planet, you guys, that have are genetically like asexual. They're not attracted to anybody. Or is that asexual is the right one, right? Yeah. I don't even I don't even yes. know the drop down. They don't identify on, on all the Facebook. Of, Every yeah, time well, I see the Facebook other see. than married and single, and you can drop that yeah, down. People who asexual, people who identify with little or no sexual attraction to others. Exactly. So relationships for an asexual oh, they're gamers. person. Gamers. Right. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> like, what are you uh -oh. talking about? <laughs> uh, I, 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 hey, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Don't, don't yeah, send don't me any hate mail. Some of the art, don't don't the send audience. me any hate mail. <laughs> I'm cutting that out of the replay before it goes to everybody. Like the, the thing, uh, the thing about it too, is it's just, you get these, get these people that um man i lost my train of thought now because that was <laughs> no, uh, now I, i'm thinking I, about that <laughs> no you're just saying that you were on the on the on the whole concept is why that would be a good one is why do you, uh, why are you concerned in up in other people's business well it's the same thing all the time right like yeah. i ask myself that question all the time like why people are so interested in someone's relationship or sexuality six states away from them like yeah. how that's so that's the thing that permeates their mind on a day to day basis instead of like uh, children starving or something that I don't know. Oh Let me just God. throw some shit out there, you know. Yeah. But and, but and let me an, animals with... needing care that you can keep oh going and going and going. Yeah. Don't don't uh, don't send my wife any video of someone being mean to pets because uh, she went off the other day while she was cooking and I had to go up there and calm her down because there was uh People were, I, I guess, hundreds of people have gone to the hospital in Las Vegas because it got to 120 degrees. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And people didn't realize that the little poles that people might lean up to or a box that might hold mail or newspapers or something, you know, metal, yeah, metal that that the metal was 141 degrees. So right, they just yeah. had random people that were going up and leaning against the pole and getting second degree burns on their hands. And I'm going like, there ought to be something that tells you that I should be someplace else right now, other than here. But <laughs> there was something about the uh, the, the weather in, in Death Valley. Yeah, it's yeah. like you know, I saw that. I got on the subject. I got on the subject because it during that lady was wa talking about this, right? They had this gun, you know, and the asphalt was 140 degrees, the concrete, you know, and then this like boiling woman, on that. and then this woman goes by and she's walking a dog. Terry forgets everything that's going on. And she's like, what the F is wrong with this person? And I said, 
the dog had shoes on. And she's like, really? And I said, yeah, but isn't it funny how fast he wanted to destroy this woman? <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, hey, you know, we, we jumped the judgment pretty quick. But to finish yeah. that one thing that I was talking about, the two reasons that that you are not finishing something and you're you don't have an imagination of a long term thing that you can create is you haven't found it yet. We step into things and keep looking at this word failure and the opinions of other people that don't mean shit. You deserve to try as many things as you possibly can to find the thing that gives you joy to find the thing that really, really gets you excited that you lose sleep over it. Uh, you start blowing off stuff because of it. It's like, hey, you guys want to go out? No, no, I'm building my, my, I'm building my dream. I'm <laughs> building my imagination. I'm, I'm happy. I always know that people want to be happy, but happy is moments. But really the true joy of living and feeling like you're alive is pursuing you the know, pursuit you're of happiness actually, is sure. what you're saying is yeah. the way to be. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of there are many people happiness. out there that say the pursuit is what is making you happy. Once you reach the goal, then what happens after that goal? Uh, you know, it's like you gotta well, find you, another you one. The most, uh, you gotta I, I, be on another pursuit. Yeah. And so, so the first one is try as many things as you can. You know what I mean? But the one thing that I want to really be positive on a number two, and I got this out of a book. I'm not promoting it because I didn't read it. I, I've gone through a lot of videos on it, but it, it's uh, Robert Green that wrote the 48 laws to power. And he has a book out there also called mastery. And one of the things that you'll listen to in a short video, if you look him up on YouTube, Robert Green, and then put in mastery, he's got some short videos that are pretty powerful of just the top points that he's made from every lecture. And one of the things that is the opposite of mastery is going from like the Dunning-Kruger effect of saying, I already know what I don't want or what I want. You just keep going from thing to thing to thing to thing to thing to it's thing. It's like they're chasing the Dunning-Kruger effect. They're chasing that high of thinking that they're gonna be really good at something. And the moment they realize they're not, they just jump to something else they think they might yep. be good at instead of pursuing the thing that they want. I, you know, I've done this. So it's like, I, I have to, I have to. Yeah. So when I, when I ran into the concept of what if I had 30,000 people or more active subscribers, that's the way I call it right now. Then it's funny because the thing that you're looking for the most, you then will get validation of that. So I've done my searching to find out that I know at least three people that have had over a million people as active subscribers. Now, this is before the YouTube or the Facebook stuff. Now, if you ask how many people had a million plus active subscribers, that's a long list because it's the, the world is made or the universe has basically made it easier for someone to get that. But behind me, you see 19 trophies of me pursuing a million active subscribers and that vehicle wasn't able to make it. <laughs> so I'm saying to you that the goal of being responsible for helping people change their lives is always the goal. It's still a million active subscribers. And if I don't do that in whatever company that I'm currently affiliated in, then I'm going to achieve that with my YouTube channel. Or I'm going to, you know, it, there was, um, I don't even think I've shared this story yet with you guys, but uh, uh, maybe I did on, on the Imaginators. Uh, but there was this girl that um, just got a job. She's gonna be a commentator for the Olympics. And I think it's NBC that, that, that uh, hired her. But the reason they hired her is she's the number one female podcaster. Her name is Alex Cooper. And she has a podcast, her podcast is called Call her daddy. Yep, I know. I immediately knew who it was. <laughs> okay, she just signed a Spotify agreement for sixty million dollars for the next three years, 
and she has 5 million listeners per podcast. And I think she just turned 29. I, I'm like, why does like my mind is like actually just like pops when I hear that. Yeah. And uh, she, I forget what she said that she did like a uh, podcast for two and a half years. And one day, an agent for Miley Cyrus called her up and said, Miley loves your podcast. Would you be interested in having her on your podcast? Bam! So now all of a sudden overnight, you know, uh, Miley Cyrus being Miley Cyrus, you know Especially what I mean? at I the just... time when she started it. Yeah, which Miley was even bigger at that time. But it's like... That's the type of I love you talking about this stuff because I love these types of stories. There's another one even that I learned the other day with Twitch. There's this guy he's a younger streamer. And his name's Jinxy. And now what's cool about stats and the Internet is that you can track all of these things. now. Yeah, it's not so, bullshit. So you could put in his name on a website called Twitch Tracker. Jinxy currently goes live on Twitch maybe four or five times a week and streams live to about 100,000 live viewers on Twitch, <sighs> right? He's one of the bit largest on the platform. If you look back, and this is in the Ludwig video even, if you look back at um, the first two years that Jinxie streamed, he was streaming to two people for two years. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. And get, guess this. He was streaming to those two people for six to eight hours on those days for two years. He's now a multimillionaire and one of the biggest streamers in the entire world. Great so story, man. Great that's story. the same with Mr. Beast. I remember the moment when um, there's this wet, there's this one YouTube channel uh, called T-Series. It's like owned by... Uh, this Indian They're way up there. I remember seeing them. And on there was the a list. moment in time where PewDiePie was like the biggest YouTuber. And this is when I was growing up on YouTube with like PewDiePie and all these people. Right. He's like close to my age even. And um, I remember the moment that PewDiePie was getting close um, to beating T-Series as the most subscribed channel or something along those lines. If you look it up, Mr. Beast, this smaller YouTuber, got a billboard. And and was like subscribe to PewDiePie. It was a billboard, and he shot a video. He's like, I got no a video. Way. I got a video. He's like, we cannot let T Series win. We need to be. We need to make sure PewDiePie is the most subscribed channel on YouTube. So of course PewDiePie watches Mr. Beast's video of him buying a billboard saying subscribe to PewDiePie on YouTube. Yesterday he or today he pat Mr. Beast passed 300 million subscribers. Mr. Beast is the most subscribed YouTube channel on youtube and it's not by a little bit anymore like he passed yeah. t-series like a couple of months ago i think he gained 10 million subscribers you guys in one month t-series right now has 269 million subscribers yeah and he just passed 300 million so i was watching him do it because there was live tickers even on youtube and stuff of him getting close to passing them because they they ended up passing pewdiepie and becoming the largest channel again so now, yeah, Mr. Beast is not just the largest YouTuber, one singular person. He's also the largest streamer. He's also the largest, like, he he has a video coming out on the 17th on his channel where the 100 largest content creators on planet Earth are competing against each other. It's his largest YouTube video. He's been promoting it. But you see Ludwig's in this video, uh... Uh, Jinxie, the guy who just names in this video. There's all these people are in this video, and you go, man. There's only a couple of people that could get these like the, the Avengers together. Gonna... You know what I mean? <laughs> well, didn't you send me a post today that uh, uh, Mr. B said I'll see you guys in 15 years because I'm too young to be the president in the United Yeah, you have to be States. 35 to run for president of the United States. So we'll see. In he's 26 now. We'll see in nine years. Nine years, yeah. How much he does. I think it'll be a lot. Oh my God. And, and imagine that we're going to see firsthand because Donald Trump won the presidency because of influence. And if right. he wins this presidency, it'll be the same reason. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um, 
because it's not i don't think it's on politics it's on it's on that right so well, don't they call that don't they call that uh everyone's upset because they're saying that uh the populist party shouldn't win am i saying the word right well like whatever whatever gets the most votes like um well when he won the first time they were just saying that he was he won um, the first time by electoral college but is that just, what you but, mean but he was he just win the popular, popular. vote it, you don't yeah, need to well, be a politician that happened before you too. just need to be popular that's an element of it but i think the influence is the is the big thing if mr right. beast yeah. told a group of people and this it, this is the same with jinxy as a streamer you guys can look these this other guy up his name's kai sanat this guy is young i think he's 24 or something like that he went and did this pop-up thing in new york's Times square and there was like a hundred thousand people there they had to shut down and he gets 100k view he's like the second biggest streamer right if not the first golly 8.49 million yeah wait 8.49 million what subscribers right well if you look at his twitch it's it's nuts too but um because that's where he predominantly is but you look at somebody like mr beast and you think of the level of influence that he has and then you think of somebody like donald trump or we could even go back to like infancy of social media with barack obama how oh, does yeah. how does barack obama beat hillary clinton and then eventually win the presidency influence yep yep he had more influence over people than Hillary did, and that then he, um, he, he gave McCain people had. hope. He gave exactly. people hope. Well, I think it shows Trump, how powerful Trump was fighting the machine at be. the time. The first time he ran, he was like anti establishment, anti machine, right? Yeah. He's like, we're going to drain the swamp and all these things. And people go, fuck yeah, that's what I want. You know what I mean? I want things to get better, of course. And ben, do so, you know of a, do you know of a person named David Dobrik? Yes. Yeah. I know David Dobrik. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so Terry and I are watching, uh, we love watching, like right now, David Letterman, and he did uh, uh, an incredible uh, interview with- uh, On with Netflix, Miley, he does. With Miley yes. Cyrus. Um, and, um, and uh, you know, so does Kevin Hart. Kevin Hart has this heart to heart. Oh my God, these things are just incredible. And so, you know, Kevin, you know, he's now- worth 500 million dollars because he's got his stuff and everything by the way so kevin he, hart was on kai sanat stream on twitch twice one time he just got on there it's so funny if you guys look it up because he has no idea what the what the fuck is going on he's like wait was this person he's like he just donated a hundred subscriptions and he's like why would he do that why would he take away he's like you know what screw you man he's like no 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 that's a good thing and he's like oh awesome dude thanks for giving the subscription <laughs> Because when he said he gave subscriptions, he thought he didn't even know what the hell that meant. Right. Most people right. don't but he didn't understand terminology. Right? Exactly. And then he came. That stream was so su successful, like 500,000 people watched it live. What? Um, yes. That then he came back and did a whole sleepover stream where he stayed on for like all night with Kai and a bunch of his other friends in the same room. And that stream, I think, had I it almost a million people watch that wow so, so heart to heart uh, kevin hart does this thing called uh face off hopefully he has kai oh my on God. It. yeah I, I don't know if you guys have ever seen kevin hart do this face off stuff but he's got these three couples and what he does is he has them competing against each other and some of the stupidest things you've ever seen uh, and it's called face off you just sit there and watch it and watch you know like on zoom you're watching three couples compete while him sometimes and his wife is there and they're just competing in all this stuff for money for charity. You know what I mean? And the stuff that he gets them to do is, I mean, you're just like, you can't stop laughing. So we're watching it. We're going through episode to episode to episode. Um, you guys got to watch it just to tell me what you think. You guys will crack up. And so one of the, one of the people that were on there was this, uh, a uh, David Dobrik. And so he's on there and, and right away, this is how Kevin Hart introduced him. He said, this guy's got, you know, 7 million, uh, 7 billion views on his YouTube channel. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, and so he, him and his buddy are both wearing hats and it's Dobrik pizza. 
So right. I guess he's got these big pizza places in LA, in LA and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and and I'm listening to this kid, and he's funny. So they just asked him out of nowhere, you know. So what video do you have that has the most views? And he goes, Well, you know, it's all about stunts and doing stuff. And and Kevin goes, Yeah, I know. I I've actually been involved in some of this stuff. So what kind of stunt did you do? And he says, Well, my partner right here, what I decided to do is uh his grandpa died years ago and he said so what i did is i proposed and married his grandmother and took her to ha to hawaii for our honeymoon and she's 87 years old <laughs> so if you go to david dobrik right now he did this as a stunt on his friend and so when he heard about it he goes oh of course this is a stunt but then they had the video of them in Las Vegas and the marriage. And then he seen the marriage certificate. He still thought it was a joke. And it's not a joke. If you go to the website right now or look him up on Google, it says that he was married to this lady for a year. <laughs> Anything for the content. That's some content brand yeah. right there. And I think, how did he say it? He said, I just couldn't wait until he finally clicked in his mind that i was his step grandpa <laughs> <laughs> that's funny it's like the uh I, I that old back when i grew up i thought snl at that time was like in not in its heyday because obviously it's had many heydays but right. the early 2000s where they had andy samberg on and they did like the uh the Lonely Island stuff with Justin Timberlake and stuff where they had yeah. the mother lovers and it was like Mother's Day. So then they go out with each other's mothers. If you guys oh, see God. that song, God, it's so funny. But yeah, I mean, when, it, when it that, is. Wasn't that song like Junk in the Box or something like that? Oh, Dick in the Box? <laughs> it's, that's a different song. Yeah. Yeah. Oh wow. That was, that's the uh that's the Hey, this the whole gift, podcast. Right? This whole podcast is about doing things long term. It's like long term. Yeah. Robert. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> why I'm the youngest one here. So yeah. why you guys your guys' minds are in the gutter. I'm not thinking yeah. any of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you just haven't ex been exposed to it. Yeah, hey, right. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> My sheltered heart. <laughs> yeah, but um, you know it, it's it's funny that we brought up all these people's names and did some great 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 stats and data. Um, you know, I was figuring it out really quick. Roger Pensky, I don't know if you guys knew this, but you know, he's his birthday's on February twentieth, and mine's for February twenty first, and so that's always been something that really. But he's eighty seven years old, but he pursued one imagination for 78 years and he's still doing that so when you heard charlie munger died and warren buffett is now the the sole owner of brick and shire hathaway i mean i have no idea how old charlie munger was or what warren buffett is doing now but you know people want to leave something and make an impact in this world but you know, they give up on something every 60 days, every 90 days. I'm just asking you, maybe you should take the time to read Rich Dad, Poor Dad and, and think about, because like Matt said, there's there's going to be two groups of people in the near, near future. And when we say near future, I'm talking less than three to five years. And there's going to be two groups of people. One group of people are going to be struggling and another group of people are going to be making millions of people happier that they were with them in a community than not. And so I don't know when you think you should start on learning. And then one other thing I wanted to say, I, I, I'm not going to say his name, but there was someone recently that I shared with Matt and my wife, Carrie today that, um, you know, people can dedicate their lives to something. And then all of a sudden that doesn't exist anymore. And we hear this all the time, like with Kodak, you know, not thinking that digital art, they actually had people that said this in a boardroom, people testified to it. And they said, people are not going to be interested in pictures they can't physically touch. 
and also too kodak made the mistake of actually being part of the invention of digital cameras early on and saying yeah. no to the idea so they were yeah. like what do you mean you invented the shit that's going to put us out of business <laughs> it's like no you don't understand this is the next step and it's like it's going to put us out of business it, yeah and then it's it like did, a, but it was because they didn't do it it's like Sony AT &T, got uh AT&T had a whole lab in research and development that came up with the cell phones. And then it got voted on in the board and they said it was an expensive walkie talkie. <laughs> right. So two brothers worked in that lab called the Macaw brothers. And they're the one that started LA Cellular. And then I think it was eight or nine years later, AT&T had to buy it back from them for 9.6 billion. <laughs> it was, they got paid. They got paid to invent the product that AT&T yeah. had to buy back. It blows my mind still like thinking long-term because we're just talking about it. Short-term game, yeah. long-term planning. Imagine you created a company, right? And your company is doing really, really, really well. And so well, in fact, that one of the largest companies on planet earth comes to you and goes, we will buy your company for a billion dollars. How do you say no to a billion dollars? It's so hard to say no to that. Imagine that Yeah, you'd have to have long-term thinking. Yep. So you have, you have two separate types of people. You have one who is that goes, you know what? I don't, I, I I'm done. I'm calling it a billion is more than I ever anticipated ever yeah. seeing in my life. So let's sell it. And those two people are the guys that invented YouTube and they sold YouTube for a billion dollars to Google. YouTube now is the second largest site on the planet outside of Google and the amount of ad revenue and money that passes through YouTube is more than most countries. Yeah. So that $1 billion acquisition, because every single time an ad gets run, you get paid a percentage, not all of it every single time a video gets watched or all these different things, right? Of course you have to pay for server hosting, but you think about these things. That was that they went short-term planning. I don't want to build YouTube anymore. Let's get rid of it. Give it to Google. Google had long-term planning for it. It worked out. Now you have the opposite. Mark Zuckerberg. Mark Zuckerberg got offered billions of dollars many times over to buy Facebook, including from Google and Microsoft um consistently said no still has the most market share of his own company right still is ceo yep. and leader enough of the board that he can't be taken off of it like steve jobs did or sam altman did for a little bit with open ai uh if you went and look at meta stock they were actively trying to get rid of him and if he wasn't in that position they would have done what they did to steve jobs to mark zuckerberg over the last couple of years because he took all the money and went we need to invest it in AI and VR and AR because that's the future. And they all went, dude, we're a social media platform. He's like, nope, I know we own Instagram and WhatsApp and Facebook. We're going to rebrand my entire company because it's mine. We're going to rename it. I dude, what are you that. talking about? Facebook is a household name. You want to rename it to something else? Yes. What do you want to rename it? Let's call it Meta. Okay. Where did you come up with that? Well, it's based off of the idea of a metaverse, which is this virtual reality place that we'll all interact in in the future. Dude, that doesn't exist. Why would you want to invest billions of dollars every single year into a stupid idea like VR, AR, and artificial intelligence? What a bad idea that was five years ago. Billions, you guys, for reality labs is what it was called. If you go look at the stock right now, it's up. And Mark Zuckerberg, once again, is one of the wealthiest people on the planet. Because instead of thinking of short-term gains like all the people that wanted to kick him out of the company, double down on social media, dude. Right. He's like, I'm the guy that saw it coming, dude. <laughs> now they're counting pennies and counting stuff. Now yeah, they're looking at like... their stock and going, thank God Mark Zuckerberg said no and we didn't get rid of him because VR is exactly where Apple is. AR is exactly where Microsoft and Apple and all these companies are. And AI, exactly where all these companies are. So he bet five years into the future and was right. That's the difference. You have to well, how but can, imagine how, how many times have... you have to think. Yeah. How many times How do you have to explain I'm making a mistake? I can see down yeah. the road. Yeah. And that is the big thing is right. trying to get people to imagine 
okay, where they are now and where they want to be down the road. People think of that instant, okay, instant gratification. Instant I want the results. money now, right? I want it now. Exactly. He was blowing the, billions and losing billions, and everybody looked at him like he was an idiot. You know what I one, mean? The person, the one penny a day for a month versus one million dollars. That is so classic of instant results versus long term right. thinking. And it's it's the deal. I wanted to throw a stat in here that you guys really love. I put in here, uh, um, how much money did YouTube pay YouTubers in 2023? <laughs> oh. Because I know they're a publicly traded company. Right. So it says in 2023, YouTube generated approximately $31.5 billion in revenue. So that's a large number. Oh, wow. Uh, a portion was paid to content that net? creators. Uh, well, that's in the gross, I think, right? right. Yeah, that, that's, that's their gross. And it says a portion of which is paid to content creators to monetize methods such as ad memberships and super chats. The top YouTuber earns earner is Mr. Beast, which generated income of over $82 million in 2023. Yep. So uh, the YouTube partner program basically says you got to qualify. You got to get a, a thousand subscribers and 4,000 hours. Um, um, and it says here that it splits the revenue with typically earnings of 55% of ad revenue goes to YouTubers. So if, if that's correct, that means that, that YouTube paid around $10 billion to YouTubers. Yeah. For the content well, I, they're paying for the content that's created. So well, the they channel make an ecosystem, can be the, the vehicle community. that they make money from. Yeah. Wow. There's people that can make more money. There's, there's streamers or content creators that get offered multi-million dollar deals that turn of them course. down because yeah. simply because they don't want to leave the community that they've developed on that website to move to another website. And they oh, know wait how a minute. They actually disastrous care for that is. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. So you, you have those certain situations and it's just always, I don't know. It's always interesting because you can have short term versus long term thinking like Believe it or not, someone offered Mr. Beast like a billion dollars to buy up all his businesses and something at one point. He made a video about it and said how he had to turn that down because yeah. Yeah. He, he's like, and you'd think for certain people, it's hard to tur turn down. But it for people that are driven and know what they're capable of, it's not. No. Right? Yeah, this is this is interesting that you, at this point in the conversation in the podcast, because I wanted to I bring up, OK, uh, Charlie Munger and uh, Warren Buffett. Now, these are people who see the long term thinking of a company. They do not want to disrupt it. They will buy it. They may infuse extra money in it. They will get a little bit of result from the start of that because they're doing that to help the company. But what are they doing? They are looking at the long term Always. thinking and the long term result. So they're not going to go in, buy up the company, rearrange it, put their people in and keep going. That's the one beauty that uh, that both of them had with building Berkshire Hathaway and everything else. The fact that they saw, I mean, like, OK, they bought Fruit of the Loom. They just basically said, mm -hmm. no. Or what was the story, Robert? Just keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah, they, they bought it, and the story was that uh, they had a female CEO. I think had been there for over 11 years, and she waited two weeks after the purchase and then called Warren Buffett and had an appointment uh, over the phone and just basically said, uh, well, you guys bought us. What's the outlook? What's the plan? And Warren Buffett said, we bought the company because of you. Mm-hmm. We bought the company because of you and the team that you created. You guys are covering the asses of the masses. Uh, you're, you're... <laughs> it's always a great line. <laughs> <laughs> great one. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, listen, just, just keep doing what you're doing. And, uh, and then I, they said that the greatest part of the call was uh, Warren Buffett said, thank you very much for calling and setting a time for us to talk. He goes, I didn't want to bother you until you needed me. And you just need to know that I'm here if you want to implement anything. Mm -hmm. I trust your CEO. I trust your leadership. And so, you know, people think that Warren Buffett, uh, I, I just uh, AI'd it really quick. 
Uh, Charlie Munger died at the age of 99. Isn't that freaking? So, and he said, here was the three steps for us. A, can I make money? Two, once I documented that, then a lot of people wanted me and Warren to make them money. <laughs> so people were giving us money. And he goes, we wanted out of that. Listen closely, you guys. He said, we wanted out of that position faster. That was our number one hunger. Because being responsible for our income is one thing. Being responsible for other people's income, that is too much pressure. We didn't like it. So we wanted to make enough money so we could buy our first company. And that was Brick and Shire Hathaway. That was a textile company. And they used that dummy corporation that was traded on NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange to start using that leverage to buy other companies. So Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger are always saying, you know, people keep giving us credit for picking stocks to make money off of. No, people make money off buying our stock because we buy companies. We buy successful running companies. <laughs> and they let them continue with the success that they have. They don't change. I used to be in the yeah. radio industry and I always, for lack of a better way of saying it, loved it when <laughs> new companies came into the market because they bought a radio station and they changed the whole format thinking that what they did was better, even though they had the numbers originally when they bought the station. If they would have just left the station alone, not change anything, keep the talent there, keep doing what they were doing, the station would have still continued to be a success. There were radio stations that went from uh, local talent, which is the big thing about radio and why it is so successful, to being either talent at one location where you have a network of stations together at a certain time, or they would pre-record everything. Uh, there's a, a format that uh, I don't think CBS runs it anymore, but there's a, a, a classic rock format out there. That's been around for a while where it's, there's not even Rick a, these? no, no, oh, no. <laughs> but the, the, that's going there's no talent. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I missed that. <laughs> no, but there's no talent on the radio station. It's all just some omnipotent voice saying AI. Hi. Yeah, it, it, it could very course, well be yeah. AI, pretty much. I think it would be a, would be considered a precursor in the radio industry to, to an AI, but it's all pre-recorded stuff. And it's not yeah. even it's not even timely. And oh. so they start taking <sighs> the personality out of radio. And what happens? The whole radio industry falls victim to what's now out. Right. Spotify, uh, podcasting, uh, all these different formats that are that people can just pull up on their cell phone Streamer. and and streamers, exactly. So yeah, it's <laughs> just syndication. Yeah, exactly, right. Melody. <laughs> but the syndication has just taken all of the personality. I mean, there's points where syndication is good and fun. But when you take the personality out of whatever it is you're doing, when you're taking that life force, I think is a great way to put it, out from what it is that made that successful, that's when well, that, everything kind of just well, that's when they that's when they go to XM radio. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's where that's actually why Howard Stern made XM radio and Sirius <laughs> so big is because he, they kept the personality. Yeah. And, and the all influence. they were able to and the influence exactly that's influence. that's the thing is like if you want to if you're lebron james and you want to play for a team your influence you could be an amazing player mm -hmm. amazing player and there's so many in the nba um and get a really nice contract you ain't getting a hundred million dollar contract unless you have influence right that is the only way you gotta fill seats. You gotta fill seat and sell jerseys. Buy, buy jerseys, sell shit. You have to be good at what you do on another level. Um, you know, like, I, I, you could see all these different people. Like Mr. Beast is another good example, right? There's yeah. the difference between someone that's going to do YouTube and someone that's going to do YouTube and make a company out of it and employ people and run a business out of it. 
you know, there's or somebody other... who believes in what they do so much that they're willing to take less. This is what Jack Nicholson did with the Batman or what Reggie Jackson did with the angels. They did. They said, okay, you give me a base salary up to a certain point, And if I draw more, then you pay me an extra Back amount end. or give me the oh, residual. Yeah. This is, on this that is, on boy, back end is definitely a uh, long-term thinking. Isn't oh my it? God. The, the, at, up until Jack Nicholson did that with the Batman, it was like, people were saying, what? You're not getting your whole money up front? No, no, no. I'm getting it on the back end and look what happened. Wow. Great example. Right. And there's great also example. so many others. I think but you're betting uh, on yourself. Like uh, yeah. Christopher Nolan is one of those directors that does that. Of course, James Cameron. Yes. Like, I was just going to say Cameron. Yes. Mm -hmm. That legit. Mr. Mr. And they Mr. show Mr. up and they bet up on, they bet themselves with their own money and they go yeah. like, they, you know, Cameron Amblin bet that on one. Titanic. Yeah. Right. Anyone? Mr. Beast has 250 employees. Yep. Well, yeah, there's people that have to make the that's make sure little, the candy bar stuff better than yeah. a, it's, it's hard to call someone like that. Um, well, going back to going yeah, back to YouTube. Yeah, yeah, going back to YouTube. What was their their net profit last year? Was how much net, billion? I, I it just says their revenue was thirty one point five billion. OK, okay yeah. So, that's, so yeah, the gross. So I looked up the gross of how much Amazon made last year do you guys want to guess how much 300 billion 30 billion 30 billion okay wow so to to show you where things are going and entertainment's obviously going this way look around right yeah yeah it's 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 now in a place especially with as things go and become less expensive and easier to make and i keep saying this over and over again but YouTube is the next form of entertainment for the way that people consume media. Mm -hmm. And it's going to continue to be that way. I think you look at the stats when I'm saying 100,000 people like you're talking about radio, Craig, and we can right. even bring up Howard Stern. I don't I don't know. I would be interesting to see what the numbers were back then. And then also on Sirius XM, how many people listen to Howard Stern? Because oh, he took totally so many people off of the terrestrial radio market because people wanted to hear him so bad. And here's where the influence factor comes in. People wanted to hear him so bad that they would pay and serious bet on him for doing this. They they put the money up to say, OK, they we're going to give you hundreds of millions, 100 million. Ooh. Exactly. Ooh. 100 million pay? dollars up Who would front pay to listen to a radio station. Well, look what's happened. Yeah. A lot of people. A lot of people. <laughs> That's exactly. the thing. It's the and influence. it was almost a bit yeah. the start of streaming services because of that. And look where things are now. Matt, you bring that up with like, okay, YouTube, there's channels that play music. There's channels that uh there's talk radio on yep. YouTube. Rain. YouTube is its own broadcast media now. And, still and it's grow. beating everybody by a long yeah. shot. It's yeah. not even close. I could yeah. look up. Broadcast look up and tape, cable television stations right now are hurting because of streaming services like YouTube. Because exactly what you said, Matt, where people are wanting their, uh, okay, fine. In this case, instant results, instant gratification on YouTube because there's the snippets there. And then there's also the long form people who would rather listen to a Mr. Beast or watch that show like rather than some decision. procured media on yeah. ABC television. Maybe I have 10 minutes here and I have an hour here because I'm running on the treadmill yeah. or I have this here or that. It really gives you the ability to do those things. And then of course the algorithm becomes better and better enough to serve you shit. You actually want to watch instead of paying for something for one month, just so you can watch the one thing you want to watch and then cancel it. Um, which exactly. is how all, most of the social networks work or uh, the streaming networks. Believe it or not, last last year, Disney profited $31 billion. So yeah, that, that, goes, I... that goes to show that, believe it or not, YouTube's still going in the up and up of those curves. Disney's been yeah. going down in that curve. But that's, you know, you accumulate a lot of things to that. Right. But um, YouTube, YouTube TV has 8 million subscribers and made $7.5 billion. 
and that's just a streaming their, service, right? Just off their, just off their YouTube TV. <laughs> yeah. But people don't, people never look this up. They don't notice that these trends are happening because they're not in them. Like mm -hmm. I, I grew up with YouTube and I've watched YouTube evolve from some goofy website that people uploaded stuff to, to the predominant place people consume media and yeah. TikTok even showing up, right? And, and growing so quickly that forced YouTube to respond and they grew YouTube shorts and now that's massive, right? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it just blows my mind to, um, to be part of one of these upward trends and be part of it. You know, dad, you always mm -hmm. try to pick the right trends and stuff. And that's how I feel now. I'm like, okay, not only am I involved in storytelling and AI, but I'm also right. involved in streaming and content creation. It's like, could I position myself in any better spot for what will happen in the next couple of years? I, not from my memory, unless if I worked in AI, right. you know what I mean? Right. <laughs> that would probably be the best place to be if you were working in AI, but it's crazy. It's a great time to be alive if you want to make shit. It really is. Well, look at I, look at some I of love... the traditional broadcasters right now. Uh, sorry, Robert. Look at the no. um, you have a Bill Maher. What, the, what what was the latest rumor about Bill Maher? He's not going to be with HBO after his contract expires. He's going online on his own channel on YouTube to do his own productions. And Random. all of these other streamers, Random. Chris Williamson, Joe Rogan, um, Don Lemon is another one. Chris Cuomo, if you if you're news junkies, I mean they've all gone to the YouTube platform or the streaming platforms yeah. because they feel that that is where their voice can not only be heard, they'll be able to influence. There's that word again, influence people. Right. Uh, on how they think and feel and their way of thinking and build your, build your and, own following, build your yes. own following and, and, and don't rely on, uh, I, I think that for YouTube, when they started, I always, I, you know, sometimes it's so obvious you don't see it, but you know, from YouTube to have the vision when they started to actually think this, that, that people were going to create a channel. So we got a radio channel, we got a TV channel to think that their mindset when they started YouTube was why wouldn't you build your own channel and put up your own content? And mm -hmm. like Matt said, it's like, how long have people go gone? That's stupid. <laughs> well, yeah, it used to be like to show you how much society has changed and people joke about this. They joke sure. about it all the time with the younger generation. And I, it's one of those things that I just laugh at because it just takes a couple of minutes of thought to figure out, at least for me, maybe not everybody, but it's, it's the concept of, it's like, okay, well, it, this person makes money off streaming video games or, or making YouTube content. That's gotta be one of the stupidest things you could do. You know what I mm -hmm. mean? There's no way you're going to be a success at that. And then you see it's society slowly shift and you can see the disconnect between the generations because yeah, you every young person goes if i want to make money to get myself from a to b i'm going to do a couple of side gigs maybe i'll run uber eats maybe i'll i'll deliver groceries or something like this so i can pay my rent and stuff or, or drive people around in uber but then on the sidelines what i'm going to do is i'm going to make content and i'm going to be a content creator and i'm going to try to get eyes and get influence because i'm fully aware that that is where you go now. Like that's that's the number one job that people want. Right. Is to make content and be content mm -hmm. creators. It's not to be a firefighter, it's not to be a, an astronaut <laughs> or any of these things. And you could astronaut. joke you could joke around and say, well in China, you know it is or whatever and you hear these different types of propaganda of reasons why whatever. But I think it's just a trend of what is not only the most important but also the most fun and the most exciting route to go. It's yeah. not exciting to go up the corporate ladder as it was 50 years ago. So nope, now, no. if anything, it doesn't exist, right? Like you yeah, are more pretty much. Yeah. It's imagine coming into this situation, right? So, and I've heard this situation. You've worked 15 years at a job as an IT person or whatever it may be, right? You're a head, you're a senior person. So you're getting paid $160,000 a year, pretty good salary, right? all benefits, you got all your benefits and everything. You get fired because it's easier to hire somebody for $45,000 a year that just got out of college as an IT person and 
And so therefore it's easier to let you go instead of, yep. and that's the new, that's the new route that's people new go. Thinking, so you yeah. have people, so it's like when you join a company and you just saw someone that spent their whole career at that company get fired, what are your odds of staying at that company long term? Yeah. Like zero. You know what I mean? Well, You'd be like, you're lucky like if, if you can continue like that, if that company's got that mental. Not thinking. with AI. You, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you but I won't. mean, you know, the whole idea of the 40 40 40 concept that we've talked about before is out the window. Yeah. It so you really can't long term is. think that way anymore. And people ask no. themselves why young people's long term thinking is in content creation and not getting yeah. a job and working. Yeah. They, they see it's what like, the trends dude, I work, are. I work to facilitate the ability to do this other thing. That's the only yeah. reason I'm even working here. And it's like, uh, uh, there's a massive shift happening and people don't really realize it, you know? Yeah, and, and, and uh, you know, I, I looked up really quickly, Warren Buffett is 93, so I didn't know that Charlie was six years older than him. That's probably why he looked up to him. You know, he, he really- I gotta read up. Charlie's, uh, what is it? Poor Charlie's almanac. I got to get around to reading that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and so I, I think that we could close this out by each and every one of you going, um, you know, we have an, uh, some incredible things that we offer to the public, like our imaginators that we do on Sunday uh, and our inner circle that we do on Thursdays. And, and uh, we're even streaming this live right now. If you guys are watching it, um, recorded. We always love doing this live for for our inner circle and our and our um, um, imaginators. And imaginators. And the only reason that we wanted to bring this up is you is uh, I'll tell you how you become a long term thinker. You ready? You become a long term thinker by hanging around other people that think long term. You pick up imagination of people talking about years from now, the amount of people that they're going to impact and the legacy they're going to live. I know this is going to sound harsh, but you become who you hang around. So if everyone you know is an instant person, you're a fucking instant person. Just that simple. You got to hang around people that are constantly telling you what they're going to do this year, next year, where they're going to be in 20, you know, two years from now, three years from now, five years from now. And when you hang around people that think like that, you become that. So I got to hang around a couple of mentors that never, ever, 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 ever stopped talking about their imagination and vision. The person that taught me how to do this business 37 years ago told me, he says, have you ever heard of the Inc. 500 magazine? I go, no. And he goes, well, let me show you. Had one in his briefcase. Oh, showed it to me and he said, this company gets the 500 fastest growing privately held companies in the world. Microsoft's been on it. Steve Jobs has been on it. And he's just started listing all these names off. And he says, one day, listen to these words because it's fucking crazy. He said, one day I'm going to be on the cover just like these guys. And so whatever company hit number one, that person got their sole thing. You know, it showed them. They were number one in Inc. Magazine, right? When my mentor hit number one, it was an anniversary series. So they had my mentor on the cover and they had Bill Gates, and they had Steve Jobs. He told all of us, I'm getting all my hair standing up. <laughs> I'm going to be on the cover of Inc. Magazine as the number one fastest growing company, and I'm going to be on the cover just like the rest of these guys. He's the only one that has his picture on the cover with those other guys. <laughs> <laughs> so how many people could be on a cover of a magazine but how many people would like to be, hey, Bill Gould just hit number one in the Inc. 500, just like Steve Jobs, just like Bill Gates, just. <laughs> and it's like when you hang around people that uh, and here's my last statement that's really, really fun is I hung around people that that usually life is the opposite of what you believe. I hate to tell that to you, but it is. 
but people that are long-term thinkers are talking as if it has as, as if it happened already they're a little out there they're they're the out there people like the apple commercial you know it's the people that are the weirdos the the rebels the misfits the, re, the, misfits, the rejects that that are going, I don't give a fuck what everybody else says that I need to do. I don't give a shit about anybody's opinions, but my own. And, and so when you see the people today, like an Elon Musk or, a, or, or the guy that started uh, NVIDIA and you, you see these people, the one thing they all have in common is they have other people that have already done it before them as inspiration of the story. It's like these guys started out of their fucking garage and here's what you got to do that no one else will do. You got to tell the world. You got to shout it from the rooftops and tell everyone the imagination that you're going to accomplish. So you imagine it, you tell the fucking world, and then you figure it out on the way. <laughs> you do not figure it out first. You do not figure it out first. You cannot know what's going to be different in the future. It's impossible. So sometimes you create a computer that's a personalized computer because you want to compete against Dell and these other companies and you call it Lisa and you put, put it out in different colors and everybody goes, fuck no. <laughs> <laughs> and then the board gets mad at you and kicks you out of your own company. It's like you got the yin and the yang, like Matt talked about, you know? So, you know, the first step is you got to consistently try things. But if every one of you would just talk to yourself, you know the thing that you have. And you've heard me tell this to you guys a million times. There's people that make a full-time income by skipping rocks on water uh, stacking plastic cups, throwing darts, uh, uh, sharpening fucking pencils, drawing stick cats. It's like, here's where people, you got to understand your long-term thinking is if you've got a long-term imagination and you're shouting it from the rooftops and you're figuring out as you go, your audience will show up. To this day, I do not understand where there's a group of people that would like to send a person a pencil to have it professionally sharpened by a professional pencil sharpener. See, to me, that makes no sense. But to the guy that's sharpening the pencils that are mailing them out, you know, I got some more pencils today I'm I'm charging people $25 to sharpen a pencil. And then I put it in a nice little tube and then I send it back. It's like, my God, when you see how people really make money. And then we were talking about the streamers. I was the guy. I need you guys to understand that I'm a lot like you. So when I seen my sons and it was funny as they're growing up, I'm hearing both of them in two separate rooms. And the house is vibrating because Matt and Kyle are laughing their asses off. I mean, they have headphones on. They don't know how long they are, how loud they are. And they're laughing their asses off. And I knock on the door. They say, what's going on? And I'm going, what are you watching? And they're going, I'm watching a guy watch YouTube videos. <laughs> and I'm going like... I'm watching a guy play a video game and my mind goes, that is stupid. Until they got old enough to understand how to explain to their father. So I'm like, joke with them. This is my inside joke with my sons and my wife is guess what? There's a great big fight happening this weekend on MMA. You want to watch it? And they're like, no. And then one day Matt came to me and he said, so wait a minute. Are you watching people that know about MMA fighting and they're telling you what's happening to a fight that you're actually fucking watching at 70 bucks a pop on pay-per-view? Are you watching people talk to you about what you're both fucking watching? <laughs> uh, 
That's not funny. You know, so we watch basketball. We watch football. We watch any kind. I watch NASCAR. And they got three guys that understand NASCAR. And they're talking about NASCAR while we're all watching NASCAR. Yeah. And I'm going like, wait, wait a minute. This idea has been around for a long time. Yeah, no, it, I mean, think about it this way. There's so many people, and it took me a while to get this too, but it's like, um, not only are these people building a community or whatever, but they're also, uh, like, they're commenting on certain things that are happening. Similarly with, like, a Joe Rogan on a UFC fight or anything along those lines, like the commentators you're talking about, right? They bring not just insight, but then they also bring entertainment. Yeah. Because when Shaq's mm -hmm. commentating a basketball oh! match... That is yeah. a reaction. Yes. And believe it or not, people get paid hundreds of millions of dollars to do exactly what you just did while watching YouTube videos. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're well, you're almost pulling people out of the two chairs next to you. <laughs> right. No, I was watching this because I'm trying to get more more of an understanding of like the big the big dogs on Twitch. Right. The people that are really pulling in big numbers. Like, what are they doing? So last night I watched this one streamer. He's 26. His name's Queso. And there was like 70,000 people watching him play some indie horror game last night. And I'm watching him react and make content out of nothing. And I'm like, that's the skill. I That's the skill. The phone rings in the video game. And the person's like, this is your first night in the job. And here's what you have to do. He goes on a five-minute rant in the middle of the stream about how fucked up it is that this is the first day on his job and they're forcing him to do all these he's playing into it and making it interesting oh, kind of like man. improv you know right. it's like they throw you something right. and then you play with it um it's just that's another level of that that's that's kevin hart's superpower I, that's a lot of comedians that's what podcasting and a lot of that reaction kevin hart's is. superpower oh, yeah. is while you're talking and you're asking him if he knows about something he goes well ask me a question and the person will say, well, how many subscribers does this channel have? And he goes, what do you think? And he's going, the person goes like, like 300 million. See, I knew that answer. And you're going, <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> no, I but know what you're saying. Li listen yeah. to this. Joe, do you guys know Joe Rogan's quick story? Okay. People don't know this it. about Joe Rogan, but Joe Rogan got his first job on the Disney channel. He was actually in one of those funny sitcoms. Oh, that's funny. And people liked how he was so full of energy and stuff that he, we all know about his fear factor while he's doing, you know, stand up comedy and he's not doing really well. Dana White buys the UFC, the ultimate fighting championship. He blows to a room and the whole room is nothing but videotapes of fights that they recorded before he got there. And he was looking through these videotapes and all, all was on this videotape was this was the name Joe Rogan. So this was in somebody else's thoughts, right? He puts it in and it's Joe Rogan doing an interview for Conan O'Brien. And he started watching it and he was there to promote Fear Factor, right? And then all of a sudden Conan O'Brien goes, uh, I understand that you also fight. He goes, yeah, I'm a professional kickboxer. And he says, but not anymore. And, and Conan Bryan goes, what do you mean? He says, have you heard of mixed martial arts? And he goes, no. And he goes, man, these guys that know multiple skills and multiple different things like jujitsu. And then they also know, you know, Taekwondo and karate and boxing. He says, mixed martial arts. These guys can kick everyone's ass. <laughs> and he, and Joe, Ro, I mean, O'Brien was going, what? And he went off on like a five minute deal on how fast a mixed martial artist could beat a boxer. And that was on videotape. And so Dana Wyatt looks at it and says, my God, this guy is a pro fighter. Then he stopped. Now he's getting into mixed martial arts, learning Brazilian jiu-jitsu. But this guy's excitement and his facial expressions and explaining to Conan O'Brien. So Joe Rogan, got Dana White called him, and he says, hey, um, 
are you familiar with the UFC? And he says, yeah. And he says, we're doing our first first fight, which this is a side note. Please don't get mad at me for saying this. But Dana White would not be a multi-billionaire without Donald Trump. You listen to Joe Rogan talk about Donald Trump and you're going, wow, maybe he can be multi-personalities. There wasn't one state in the United States other than New Jersey that would allow mixed martial arts fights. And when Dana White bought UFC, Donald Trump called him up and said, you can do it at my casinos. And when Dana White showed up, not only would he sell tickets to Donald Trump for the UFC, but Donald Trump would sit there in, the, in every single fight. See, no one hears the good stories about somebody on either side, right? So then he calls up Joe Rogan and he says, listen, would you be interested in com uh, coming here? I'll fly you out. You can sit at the ring and you can call these fights. And Joe Rogan did 13 shows, UFC championship fights for UFC, and didn't get paid a fucking dime. <laughs> now he's got this audience, right? And then all of a sudden he goes from this audience to working for Dana White and UFC, and then he launches his podcast when there's 11 million people watching a championship fight and no one wants to watch it without Joe Rogan commentating it. So how do you build an audience? I don't know. Maybe like Matt said, you know, Mr. Beast decides to do a bulletin board and pay for it himself to help another person get more YouTube people. Man, sometimes your vision is not about what you're going to get paid immediately. An instant mentality is working Monday through Friday, getting paid on Friday. There's people out there that are like, do you have a clue where we're going to be in three years? Do you have a clue where we're going to be in five years? And they're willing to be consistent all day, every day with their enthusiasm, their excitement, their energy, and they're willing to work for no money to get paid a lot of money in the future. And everyone I've talked to that has done long-term thinking, here's the thing that happened to Robert Hollis that I hope happens to you. Is the day that you walk up and wake up and went, everything in my life is way bigger than I ever imagined. Every area of my life is way beyond my imagination because you're willing to get paid later instead of on fucking Friday. <laughs> <laughs> that was perfect. I, I got nothing to say to that as normal. That was amazing. Thank you so much, dad. Thank yeah, you. Dad. That, that's Just solid it out of the ballpark, you know, <laughs> so. Craig, Craig, you and Matt pull it out of me all the time, man. Well, well, I feel like the whole podcast builds to like the crescendo, like a music act or something. And then yeah, you just yeah. give us the final word. So thank you guys Bottom so of the much. Night, full base, full, uh, <laughs> was it bases loaded? Here comes Robert. Three, two count, two outs. <laughs> out of the park. <laughs> <laughs> thank you guys. I love you guys. Love you too. Go ahead and close us out, Craig. Thank you guys for watching us live too, by the way. Everybody that's oh, been yeah. chilling on here with us. Absolutely. Um, we'll see you guys you next time. So, and you can follow Robert Hollis at roberthollis.com. Also, if you'd like to join our exclusive communities, the inner circle and the imaginators, you can join us by going to roberthollis.com forward slash join to register. There'll be lots of great exclusive content and you'll be able to participate in our special breakthrough se sessions to help you move to the next level. Please don't forget to like and share this video on YouTube. Share it with those that have ears to hear and who love all of this stuff. We want to grow our podcast so that we can get it out there. We want to help you have you help us grow our community and our reach. And thank you very much. Thank you and shout out to our executive producer and visionary, Matt Hollis. Matt, bless you, my friend. Thank you so very much for being our foundation. And of course, Robert, Robert Hollis. Oh my gosh. 
the home run king on these podcasts. Bless you, my friend. Thank you so much for being our guide, our GPS you, to success, and a great, great mentor and a dear friend. And thank you for joining us, for taking time out of your busy schedule to be part of Unlimited Wisdom. We appreciate you. We love you. My name is Craig A. Jackman. Please be good to yourself. Be cash. And until next time, Bye for now. Thank you, everybody. Love and appreciate Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Love and appreciate you. And a shout out to all the donations. I Thank we you love so it. much, we guys. We appreciate you. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. See you later.